So uh, this talk is going to be an update on adolescent mental health, including how to talk to teens about social media use. And um, as Christina said, I'm one of the physicians in adolescent and young adult medicine at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Um, and I also conduct research in mental health services. Our location is in Pittsburgh in Oakland. Let's see if I can move this along. I'll just use the arrow. Okay, there we go. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a book that I helped to co-edit called Technology and Adolescent Mental Health, but I don't make any earnings from its sales <laughs> anymore, uh, but uh, just to throw that out there. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about becoming more aware about mental health problems which present in adolescents and review some trends, talk about specifically the common uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety, about confidentiality and management or treatment options. And then we'll consider some general advice or resources that you can provide as a supportive adult and consider the relationship between social media use and adolescent mental health and some advice you can provide. So it's important to realize that one of the most important things that can help teens is having a supportive adult. So sometimes you feel like I'm not really doing anything for this young person that I'm working with. They seem kind of, you know, annoyed or what does it matter what I say? But just remember that they're not always telling you what's going on with them. And sometimes you're the right person at the right time. So you play a really important role in supporting young people, especially those who don't have the typical family supports that might um, help them through difficult situations. And one thing to realize is that just as we expect little toddlers to start writing and reading and communicating with others, they have, you know, these developmental tasks. Adolescents and young adulthood, your task is to develop your emotional development. And so before we used to think that, oh, their brain is just not developed. But it's actually not true. So we know more about brain science now that the areas of the adolescent brain are developed, except what's different is that they're making and breaking connections more often. So you might find that you sit down with a young person and you explain to them what type of um, you know, negative things might happen if they make a bad decision like drinking and driving. And they completely understand what you're saying. And they are able to give you a lot of great reasons for why that would be a bad idea. But when they're in a exciting situation where they can take risks, their brains are wired to take those risks. So they get a lot of reward. They feel really good when they take a risk and it overrides any kind of rational decision that they might make in certain situations. So one thing to learn is it's really important to let teens take safe risks. So let them run for student government, let them get a new job, let them make new friends um, or try new hobbies uh, so that they can develop their brain in the way it needs to develop, but also kind of safeguard them around negative risks that they might take. Um, and so I'm a physician, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I specialize in adolescence. And so some people say, well, why do you care so much about things like suicide? And here's why. So out of causes of death in young people 10 to 24, the first one is unintentional injuries, and that's including car accidents. But the second one is suicide or dying uh, by you know, self-infliction. And then the third one is homicide. So it is a serious problem in young people. And when you interview young people in high school, there's a survey that uh, is done every year, about 30%, and this is before pandemic in 2017, will say that they've had persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. And 17% have said that they have seriously considered attempting suicide. So that's about a fifth of young people you might meet have thought about that uh, suicide in the past year. And this is a graph showing 
what percent of young people have different problems at what ages? So on the bottom, you see ages four through 18. And the red line is anxiety. So we see anxiety problems in younger kids starting off earlier, like, I don't wanna go to school, or I have a stomach ache, I don't wanna go, or I don't wanna leave my parent. And then the blue line is behavior problems like getting into fights, having problems with attention and ADHD. And the green line is mood. So mood is depression and bipolar disorder. And so we start seeing the first signs of that at 11. Uh, and sometimes even younger, but mostly at 11, it starts to try to approach adult levels. And then the purple line is substance use. So adolescence is the time we start to see depression. And what is behavioral health anyway? So the way we define behavioral health is mental health and substance abuse and addictions. Mental illness are conditions that involve changes in how you think, how you feel, or how you behave, or a combination. And the important thing to know is that the way we make a diagnosis is either both of these or one, that someone has trouble with functioning. So what are kids supposed to be doing? They're supposed to be going to school. So if they were a straight A student, all of a sudden they're getting failing in all of their classes, that is a sign of something wrong. But also, are they having a lot of distress? And so some kids on the outside might look like they're functioning, they're fine, but on the inside, they are having a lot of emotional distress about the problems they're going through. So it's really important to interview someone to get that information. Um, and sometimes it might not be so obvious. So one way we do this is through screening. This is a Mental Health America website has a lot of screening tests. And there are a lot of young people using these tests to question whether or not they might have symptoms of a mental illness. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't take the next step to get care. One thing we've been doing routinely in primary care settings is asking questionnaires like the patient health questionnaire nine, uh, where we screen everyone no matter what for symptoms and suicidality so that we can help pick up on problems early. So let's think about a case in school. So Josh is 14. He's never gotten into trouble at school before. You're working at the school and find out he's gotten into a fight with another boy. You ask him what the fight was about, and he says the boy was making fun of him because of his shoes. Things have been more tough at home since his father lost his job a few months ago. His family has not had as much money to buy new clothes or shoes. He feels like every little thing his mom or little brother talked to him about irritates him. And friends he used to hang out with are getting sick of his attitude. He thinks he just has an anger problem. But does he just have an anger problem? So one thing that's different in teens it, versus adults is that to diagnose depression, your mood can be depressed, sad, or it can be irritable. So being irritable in teens and being kind of argumentative with everyone, especially in boys, sometimes it shows up as kind of conflict fights and things like that. But if you ask kind of deeper questions, you could get at, are they actually feeling depressed and sad and having other symptoms of depression, which include that they used to be interested in things they're not interested in anymore. But that happens a lot in teens, you know, they're trying out different things. One key thing is, are they now interested in something else? So maybe they used to play lacrosse and now they're playing guitar all the time. That's fine. It's okay for them not to like playing lacrosse anymore. But if they've completely lost interest in things that they actually genuinely used to like before and have not found anything else, then that is a worrisome sign. So it's normal for teens to not wanna to talk to their parents anymore. But if they also don't want to talk to any friends anymore and are isolating, that's a problem. Are they feeling worthless, hopeless, guilty? Sometimes guilt is a reason why teens won't share how they're feeling. So you might feel like, man, they want to just be so private and closed off. But sometimes they're seeing the pain that we're going through as adults and feeling like I don't want to put more of my burden. It's my fault. I can't handle my own, my own problems, my own self. I'm supposed to be growing up into this adult. So I'm just going to deal with it on my own. We hear that a lot. And so letting people know, 
hey, even as adults, we don't deal with things on our own. Our car breaks down, we find someone to fix it. We, you know, I had a mouse in my shed and my husband took it out. <laughs> I didn't have to do it. We don't do everything by ourselves, but young people have this belief. And I think partly because of our society that you know, they need to figure this out on their own. And that's, that can be harmful if they think that because it might stop them from getting help. And then in their thinking, they can have trouble concentrating. So you might have somebody who you're wondering, do they have a learning issue? And it might actually be depression. If they have trouble making decisions, have suicidal thoughts. And then in terms of their body, they might feel tired, have no energy. Again, that's a common thing to see in teens, um, but is it, does it make sense for how much they're sleeping? So are they sleeping all the time and they're still tired? Also appetite, eating too much or too little. And one thing that I like to point out is, this is if you do a Google image search of teen depression, just on my computer, maybe it has an algorithm for me. But you see all these pictures, it's like obvious in the picture, oh, okay, this person was covering up their cutting. This person has their head in their hands. But in reality, depression, you can't see it. You don't see some kid in the school hallway sitting with their head in their hands um, outside of their locker. This depression can happen to everyone. Some days are good, some days are bad and you can't just see it from the outside. So this head in the hands thing, is some, it's not helpful to think about depression that way. So let's do next case. Cassie is 16. She's in the school library and all of a sudden begins to breathe heavy, clutch her chest and start to cry. She's able to drink some water and distract herself by watching some videos on her phone. Afterwards, she tells you she's been having these episodes once a week and she doesn't even know what brings them on. In general, she has been worried about everything. Everyone thinks she's doing great because she is in all honors classes on the cheerleading team, has her own YouTube channel, which has been gaining a bunch of followers and is dating someone really popular. She feels completely overwhelmed and like she's going to explode. She gets about five hours of sleep a night and has also started to have daily headaches. So this is anxiety. And the way we talk about it with young people is it's normal to be uh, worried about something, scared of something, but when you're overly worried for that situation. So we're all worried about coronavirus, but if you have no other reason to not go out, so you don't have a chronic illness, you've gotten the vaccine already, um, you're do taking all the precautions, are we overly worried? Um, so that's something that has been going on with some young people. Some young people are not worried enough. Some young people are worried too much. But talking through, like, it, are you worried to an extent that it's harmful? It's not really helping you anymore. And so that's your emotion. And it can be about everything, which is generalized, or it could be about a specific thing, like I'm only scared of spiders, or I'm only scared of social situations, um, and things like that. And then the body responses are really thinking about fight or flight response. So if you are worried, then you are going to be on guard, ready to fight. Your heart rate is beating, you're sweating, you're shaking, your muscles are getting tight, your stomach doesn't need to work because why would you digest food when you need your energy for your muscles to work? And so you're all getting all of those things as if there's a lion in front of you all of the time. And that's really taking a toll on your body physically. And so some people will talk about having headache, having stomach pain, having period cramps that are worse. And then your thoughts are about this potential danger. It's hard to think about anything else. If there was a lion in front of you, you wouldn't be able to think about anything else except that lion. You wouldn't think about how you need to buy milk. And that's how people really feel with this anxiety, except it's out of proportion. And then your behaviors might be things to limit the danger, avoid people, places. So let's say you had a bad experience in school where you were bullied, and now you're worried about being bullied again. And that's a real worry, but maybe, you know, not going to, back to school or, you know, not talking to any new, new friends or not making new friends, maybe that is too much, but someone might have a tough time moving forward unless they deal with those difficult emotions. <clears throat> so
So next one, Patricia's top of her class and extremely well liked by her classmates because of her cheerful demeanor. She comes in for a routine physical and gets a screen for depression when she is there. She decides it's time to talk and checks off that she has been having suicidal thoughts on the questionnaire. How can this be? Her primary care doctor meets with her, assures her of confidentiality, and finds out that Patricia shares she has same-sex attraction and she hasn't told her parents or her friends. Her parents are very religious and have made comments that make her feel she would not be accepted anymore. She feels that she has no options for how to move forward and has been thinking suicide may be an option that would relieve the family of the shame they might endure if she comes out. And unfortunately, uh, like I said, 17% of high school students seriously consider attempting suicide, but half of gay, lesbian, bisexual students and 30% of those who are not sure about their sexual identity seriously consider attempting suicide. These rates are even higher in those who have gender identity that is different from heteronormative. And 14% of students have made a plan. So they've thought out, how am I going to do this? And then 7% attempt suicide. About 2% make an attempt. And unfortunately, these rates have been rising and suicide attempts are higher in young people of color, especially black students, uh, Alaska natives and um, most, mostly it's been rise, differentiating in terms of the amount of attempts is higher in black students. So there's recent things that have been changing that we're tracking, but it's very concerning. And 50, only 50% 50 of victims of suicide have had a depression diagnosis. So not everybody has been identified with depression, nor does everyone feel depressed. And common things are they feel like they're a burden. They literally think people would be better off if they weren't around anymore, or they feel hopeless, like there's literally nothing else that can change in their life to change their situation, and they feel completely isolated, and then during the event, they're more likely to be uh, intoxicated on alcohol, so that's a big risk factor. They might have a stressful life event, and those who are recently discharged from the hospital. So it's really important Two, if someone tells you, I'm thinking about suicide, to take them seriously and to be an empathic listener, um, to help people to have hope, to help them feel like they belong, because that's one of the biggest things. They, they literally think, I don't belong anymore. It would be better off if I'm not here. And why don't they want to ask for help? So some young people want to ask for help, but their parent doesn't want them to. Um, I talked about feeling guilty. Some people have had a bad experience. So maybe they were in the foster care system and they felt like they were forced to get mental health help or they were, um, it was almost like a punishment. Um, some people don't think it will help. Some people are worried about others finding out because no one expects them to have those symptoms. And teens are worried about money and about time, especially if their family is going through financial struggles. So now I'm going to go over different treatment options. And one thing to know, and this is uh, state by state, it differs, but in the state of Pennsylvania, minors are patients less than 18. And so they need their parents' consent for almost all medical care, but any care that a minor has the right to consent to for themselves can be provided confidentially. And that includes diagnosis and treatment of mental health problems for minors 14 and older and substance abuse treatment. So if someone wanted to come and see me by themselves and they were 14 and they wanted to talk about mental health or substance abuse, their parent doesn't need to be there. Now, parents usually end up having to provide support like transportation or pay for insurance. Um, but if someone was getting you know, school-based mental health services, potentially, they could get those on their own. It's kind of hard for them to, to do this on their own, but um, it is part of our law in Pennsylvania. So there are some things that are helpful that a lot of different people can do. And so it helps just to have somebody that you can talk to that you're experiencing these types of problems. 
Um, so being supportive, communicating, and then being kind of a, um, an ally that can help uh, support someone in what they're doing, and then recommending things like physical exercise, healthy sleep, good nutrition, um, helping those young people who might have food insecurity, all of these things are helpful to mental health. So a primary care provider is somebody who can help with emotional health. And so if you know a young person and they don't know what to do, they're not sure whether they should talk to someone or not, um, it feels like a big leap to go straight to see a therapist, then a primary care provider is somebody that they can connect with. And all young people should be having yearly well child visits. So some parents and some you know, adults think, well, you know, teens aren't needing as many shots. Um, they're not really uh, growing so quickly as young kids. Like I don't really need to take them to the doctor every year. But that's one thing we can help with is emotional health and screening. And so talking to a young person confidentially, um, screening for possible emotional problems. And the earlier that we intervene on these, the better. We also have a program in Pennsylvania where primary care providers can help young people more easily connect with child psychiatry. So there might be people who are on a long waiting list, but we can make a phone call to a child psychiatry referral line where we can help connect uh, young people to psychiatry and therapy more quickly. So things that have been proven to help and be safe are psychotherapy and there are specific kinds that can help. Um, so not all therapy has evidence. So cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, problem solving therapy, medications like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac or fluoxetine, and then things that I mentioned before. And so what is CBT? So CBT means short-term, six to 20, one-hour weekly sessions. And you're really focusing on the strategy as like a, a coach. So what I tell young people is you're going into this and you're the one making these changes. You are doing it yourself. Your therapist is this technical expert, like they know what strategies to use, but you're the expert on yourself. And it's really important to do the homework because if you just go in and kind of expect things to get better without putting your own work in terms of journaling, reflecting, um, sometimes they give workbook sheets, things like that, it's going to be hard to, to make changes. Uh, and so really encouraging young people to, did you get homework from your CBT therapist and what were you supposed to do? This is an example of how CBT might work. So this is a young person, Jude, and he sees Destiny and he says, hey, Destiny, but she just keeps walking and she says nothing. So that's the event that happened. No one will argue if they can see what happened, that that's what happened. He said hi to her. She kept walking. But that is all that we can agree on. What happens after the event is that Jude has a thought. So Jude's thought is, wow. She doesn't want to say hi to me. She thinks I'm a dork, just like everyone else. Then his emotion comes from that thought. So his emotion is negative and he has a hard time ignoring. He feels sad and upset. Then what he does is she asks him to be lab partners and he kind of ignores her and says, uh, I already have one, thanks. So what, how he acts is influenced by how he feels and how he feels is influenced by his thought. So same event happens, but now we change Jude's thought. And now Jude's thought is, well, she seems like she has a lot on her mind. I know she has a math test today. And his emotion is he feels fine. He's able to go about his day. And then what happens when she asks to be lab partners? He asks her, hey, why didn't you say hi earlier? And she says, oh, I was so stressed about the math test. He says, no problem. So maybe she was being mean, maybe she wasn't, but he's not assuming that everyone doesn't like him. And we all know when we've had a bad day and a good day, we might have different thoughts about the same situation based on where our mindset is. And so CBT helps change those thought patterns and break down those thoughts. So medications, antidepressants are prescribed for depression, anxiety. And the way we decide whether it would be a good idea for someone 
Depends on how severe their symptoms are. Have they already tried therapy and it hasn't worked so well? Um, and the issue is they take some time to show an effect. So sometimes people want to start taking them and see a benefit right away. But it's a long process to figuring out what's the right medication, what's the right dose. We do a lot of monitoring for side effects. They actually, despite the name, help more with anxiety than depression. And we don't typically prescribe things like anxiolytics, which are um, just short acting. So these are some myths or facts about medications that I might go through with a young person. So taking medication is not going to solve the problems in my life. That's what some people may think. And they're right. Their choice to start a medication is one of many steps they can take to help with depression. I will definitely get a terrible side effect. So they may get a side effect, but most often they're mild and go away with time. And the first few weeks is really this trial run to see, do they get any side effects that they feel like they can't tolerate? So for example, a lot of people feel nauseous and that gets better with time. Um, no one is going to force them to keep taking the medication if they experience a side effect you don't like. And if they do, that is not okay. That's not ethical. So there are other medications they can try which might not have the same side effect. These medications are addictive. So that is a myth. Antidepressants are not addictive and you don't experience a high from taking them. They're a type of medication that you have to decrease slowly so you don't get side effects. So you might feel bad stopping them, but it's not because you're addicted to them. So it's important to talk to a provider before stopping them. Um, and some people have a harder time stopping it. Um, but most people do not. If I need medications, that means I'm a failure. So that is a myth. For some people, medication can help treat their depression, but it's just a medical problem. So just like asthma is not someone's fault, they may need medications to treat it. The way you can think about this is that there can be, you know, 50 people, everyone experiences the same trauma situation that happens, but not everyone becomes depressed from it. So there are different things in our genes and our environment that influence whether or not we'll develop depression, just like everyone might be around the same pollution, but not everyone gets asthma symptoms, just some people do, because we're all different. Antidepressants would definitely change my personality. That's not true. Some people experience a more muted mood, meaning they used to be super happy, and super depressed, and now they're moderately happy, moderately depressed. So their kind of range of emotions is a little bit less. And that's that can be helpful, and that can be sometimes a weird feeling for some people. So if it's not something they like, or it happens with one antidepressant, trying a different one might work better. My family wouldn't want me using these types of medications. Sometimes you don't know this. So some family members might not understand it, but there are often family members who take antidepressants that you don't even know about. And only really messed up people need medications. So that's a myth. People who decide to take medication are making a decision about improving their mental health. And it's a step someone who's wanting to reach their goals in life is wanting to take. It is not giving up. It does not mean you are messed up. It is a strength. So it's something that someone is deciding to do every day to help their mental health. How is that messed up? So it is really important to ask about suicide and that's something that we do. Clinically, we use different screeners to ask these types of questions. Um, and what I wanted to go through with you all is what is a safety plan? So a safety plan is a strategy that we use for suicide prevention where we identify someone who may be at risk for suicide, and then we talk through what are things that they can do when they have those thoughts. So if you remember, I showed you how 17% of young people have had thoughts about suicide. That's a lot. We're not sending all of them to the emergency room, right? There are different things they can do to get out of that feeling of distress um, that we can help them with. So they probably, you know, need help with those thoughts, but they don't necessarily need to go to an emergency room. So the first step is that they need to identify what are warning signs that a crisis may be developing. So do they always feel suicidal when they get into some kind of argument with their mom? 
And can they, you know, think through that and maybe have some code language with mom? Who knows they've had some suicidal thoughts? Just say like pineapple or something. Like, let's just stop this conversation. I'm getting too distressed. It's not helpful anymore. Let's take a break and talk about tomorrow. Can they kind of figure out? Or can they can they realize like, oh wow, once I start like looking at this social media site, sometimes I get too upset. I just need to like stop and take a walk or whatever it is. And what are internal coping strategies? So things that they can do to get their mind off the problem. So the thing is that it's hard to use those CBT techniques when you're super upset. So, you know, if you're having road rage and you don't wanna hit the other person because you're so mad, you can't think at that time when you're so mad, oh, well, you know, it wouldn't be a good idea. I shouldn't be having these thoughts. Maybe that person had a bad day. You can do that when your emotions are down. So first you need to get your emotions down out of those distress crisis emotions. And so what are things you can do just to get your mind off? It doesn't have to be like, you know, something that really helps overall your depression, but just in that moment. So is it, some people will do things like put ice on their face that helps lower their heart rate. Um, so there's this like ice water technique people will use. Some people might take a walk pet a dog, play music. And then the next step is, let's say that doesn't work and you still feel that way. Well, are there people that can provide a distraction? So maybe if you take a walk and you just see other people around, does that help provide a distraction? Or someone you can call, and you don't have to tell that person, like, I feel like I'm having thoughts. Just, you know, hey, let's talk about like what you did today. I just need, you know, a break from myself. And then the next step is who are other people you can ask for help? Um, and just like you know, I was mentioning before, there are definitely a bunch of young people I've interviewed who say, I don't have any adult I can talk to about anything. And so being that adult for someone, just being someone that um, is a trusted person that they can reach out to is really important because that's the step four, who's someone you can ask for help. Um, sometimes that's the parent, sometimes the young person doesn't feel comfortable with uh, their caregiver. And then second thing is professionals or agencies I can contact during a crisis. So sometimes those are therapists, um, sometimes people are available or on call. And then the next thing is a crisis lifeline. So a good one to give teens and have available is the crisis text line, just because it's anonymous and really easy for them to use. So they can text home to 741741 and they can have a crisis counselor text back and forth with them. And then in uh, Allegheny County, we have Resolve in other counties in uh, Pennsylvania, you can directly call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and then be connected to a uh, county crisis line uh, for wherever you are. And then there's other crisis resources online from SAMHSA. And then making the environment safe is very important because unfortunately, um, when someone is impulsive, if they, in, in having suicidal thoughts, if they have something that can easily cause death, then that suicide may not be prevented. And the thing that can most easily cause death is a gun. And so it's really important for families to have safe gun storage. Um, so either these are, there's are different options with different price ranges that can be provided because as you saw, suicide and homicide are the second and third cause of death. And uh, the most easily kind of that you die from suicide is with a gun. Uh, so this is something that we ask a lot about just because uh, it can really prevent um, harm. So teens should not know where the gun is. They should not be able to access it if it's there. And then in the crisis plan, we try to develop and generate hope and reasons for living. So sometimes you being kind of helping someone develop hope um, in a situation where they seem hopeless as a supportive adult can be a huge thing. And then you might, you might not even realize that's a difficult thing, but um, having them have some kind of hope that even if things are bad now, tomorrow they might get better. 
feeling responsible for family, friends, or pets, like younger siblings, concern for what others would think, being scared, having moral obligations like religion or believing suicide is immoral. Those are things that can help prevent suicide. And these are some nice slides about knowing the warning signs. Um, so uh, sleeping too little or too much is definitely a warning sign. And um, sometimes seeking revenge, showing rage. And it's okay to ask some of these questions like, do you ever think about suicide? Um, and are you seeing your doctor or mental health professional regularly? Um, you don't want to minimize problems or shame someone into changing their mind. Like, you don't really think that, do you? Or there's no way you would do that. It can be very uncomfortable. So we feel like saying those things, but actually if you say those things that might prevent someone from getting help um, and preaching about suicide being right or wrong can be not a good decision. Um, so you wanna tell them, you know, what you're going through is treatable and suicidal feelings are temporary. They don't last forever and treatment and help is available and letting them talk and listen to them without judgment. And then if they say, no, I'm going to do this right now, you don't wanna leave that person just like you would leave someone who's not able to breathe or choking and you would call 911. Um, and then if they are not in immediate danger, offering to work together to get help. So saying, okay, well, are you gonna see your primary care doctor? Let's like, touch base in a couple of days and see what happened. Um, so following up with someone and not having them feel ashamed that they told you, like keeping closed off about what they said, that can be um, unhelpful. Uh, there's definitely places to get more training for educators like the Suicide Prevention Resource Center, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, Mental Health First Aid. There's also this QPR gatekeeper training. And um, again, another mental health first aid link. This is a website for um, young people who are having a hard time finding therapy, but are really kind of motivated to do cognitive behavioral therapy. It's an evidence-based self-help guide from Australia and it costs about 39 or about like 29 US dollars a year. It's called Mood Gym. And then there are different apps that have information about um, getting help for depression and anxiety. And this one is by a colleague in Chicago um, called CBITS, and he has a bunch of different kind of small apps that are available. Um, but how do you know which ones to use? So there's some apps people are using that are completely not evidence-based, might have privacy concerns, and one website I rec recommend is actually cyberguide or psybrguide.org um, that offers information about different apps that someone might want to use. Like, you know, do they have transparency about privacy and have people actually liked it? Is it for young people? 